On Whit Sunday in 1894, police in Kingston-upon-Thames reported that 20,000 cyclists had passed through the town and along the Portsmouth Road, part of the historic Ripley Run, one of the favoured routes for fashionable cyclists of the day and known to cyclists from all parts of the globe. Cycling has never been without its controversies, and with the Portsmouth Road once again home to cyclists, there is a wonderful opportunity to rediscover the rich and pivotal moments of cycling's history here in this borough. John Keane was a carpenter's apprentice from Surbiton who became one of the most important pioneering figures in cycling's history. His journey began in 1869 when, aged 20, he won his first bone shaker race in Richmond. That victory marked the end of his carpentry career and he soon developed a reputation as the undisputed bone shaker racing champion of Britain with a speed of half a mile in two minutes and 45 seconds. Keane was widely known as Happy Jack for his notably cheerful temperament. Before long, the limitations of the heavy and cumbersome bone shakers led Keane and others to try to design something better. The results were machines far faster than their predecessors, and these were known at the time as ordinaries. Keane manufactured the Eclipse model at his workshop in Victoria Road. It was widely acknowledged to be one of the finest ordinary bicycles ever produced, noted for its height and lightweight design. A great deal of his sporting success took place on the Surbiton racetrack. It was the premier cycle track in the London area during the 1880s, popular for its fast start and racing speed. Surbiton was also considered one of the safer tracks, owing to the fact it didn't have any fencing either side that could have impaled falling riders. The Victorian Cycle Club was a unique institution combining boisterous high spirits with strict social codes. Many of these clubs frequented the Surbiton racetrack and the Ripley Road. Their membership was exclusively male and predominantly middle class. Ordinary bicycles were well out of the price range of the ordinary working man, meaning that cycle clubs had a distinctly upper crust feel about them. Club members delighted in extravagant pub lunches, favoured spots in the area being Fox and Hounds, Surbiton, and the Angel, Thames Ditton, both on the Portsmouth Road. It was around this time that Keane would delight the crowd at Surbiton Racetrack by racing against horses, and he almost always won. It was not always an easy ride for Keane, though. He had an arch rival, Fred Cooper. The pair raced 17 times for the mile title all over the country, and in front of crowds of up to 25,000 people. Keane won on nine occasions, Cooper on eight. The advent of the even wheeled safety bicycle in the mid 1880s was particularly significant for women. Cycling opened the door to a whole new world of independence because it allowed women to escape the house without the watchful eye of a chaperone for the first time. Bicycles meant that women could travel to villages and towns that had previously been out of reach and gave many middle-class women their first opportunity to develop their physical fitness. However, there was a considerable backlash against this development. Predictably, Victorian cycle clubs were deeply prejudiced towards the female cyclists. The Pioneer Gazette raged. What can be more distressing than a woman, dressed partly as a man, scorching along a dusty road, her face red, streaming with perspiration, her hair dishevelled, leaning over the handlebars in a most ungraceful and undignified attitude? In particular, there was widespread concern that the act of straddling the saddle might cause unwanted excitement. As a consequence, several unsuccessful attempts were made to produce a bicycle with both pedals on the same side to allow women to ride a side saddle as an alternative. In fact, the only real risk was one of exhaustion caused by the heavy dresses and corsets the Victorian women were expected to wear. There was fierce resistance to the adoption of more practical clothing, which was condemned as unfeminine. In time, however, the women's newfound love of cycling resulted in the phasing out of the corset and even the social acceptance of bloomers. By the turn of the 20th century, cycling had become symbolically linked to women's liberation in a way that is often forgotten today. Meanwhile, many cycle club members continued to ride their high-wheeled ordinaries well after the arrival of the safety bike, and they turned their noses up at unnecessary innovations, including brakes. By 1900, the Surbiton racetrack was receiving some negative press due to the considerable cost to cyclists of getting there from London. As a result, the track became increasingly abandoned, falling into steady decline. Happy Jack Keane's later years unfortunately also took a turn for the worse. He continued to race until the age of 36, but his health was shattered and he faded into obscurity and financial ruin. He died in 1902. The Sporting Mirror reported that no rider has done more to develop cycling than John Keane. 
In spite of the accolade, fewer than 20 people attended his funeral. Ironically, and rather poignantly, his former nemesis, Fred Cooper, was one of the very few people to send a wreath. John Happy Jack Keane is not, however, the only important figure in cycling's history. Eileen Gray was the Surbiton woman who became the driving force behind the development of female cycle racing. Born in Bermondsey in 1920, Eileen was presented with an old bicycle so she could get to work when the train service she used was damaged during the Blitz. Cycling gave her a newfound sense of confidence and freedom, and she joined the only cycle club near her home that accepted women. In 1946, Eileen and two other British riders were invited to take part in a women's track event in Copenhagen. The organisers thought it would be a novelty event, and the Danish team were actually a theatre troupe that incorporated cycling as part of their act. Miraculously, the British team won, and the experience inspired Grey to get women's cycling taken seriously. Her breakthrough came in 1955, when the UCI, cycling's governing body, finally agreed to recognise women's world records. British female cyclists, however, encountered hostility from their male counterparts. Eileen recalled how, at one meeting in Leipzig, a male colleague stole all the women's spare tyres and tubes in an attempt to debilitate them. In spite of this, the British women's team returned with two golds, a silver and a bronze medal. In addition to an impressive list of groundbreaking achievements, Eileen was instrumental in securing Olympic status for women's cycling in 1984, and she was a torchbearer for the London Games in 2012. It was on this momentous occasion that the Ripley Run, or part of it, was restored to its former glory, and thousands of people gathered along the Portsmouth Road and throughout Kingston Town to support the Olympic cycle events. So, whether you cycle for reasons of fitness, for competitive sport, or just for the sheer pleasure of it, there is so much to be celebrated in Kingston's cycling past and its cycling future. <laughs> <laughs>